my name is Gillian Erskine, and with my colleague Paul Myatt, we've created Piano Teaching Success Q&A, a program where you'll get your answers to your questions. And there are so many questions right now, as we as a profession are transforming our way of working and interacting with our students into a virtual environment. Times like these lead to so many opportunities, and we feel confident that when we emerge from this current crisis, the new skills and technologies we've embraced will give us all greater freedom and opportunity that will forever change the way we teach and our students learn. Most of us have done what's needed to be done to get ourselves up and running online, and it's been a couple of weeks of trial and error, ups and downs, and highs and lows. So, what's next? Many questions we've received this week are focused on how to improve this learning environment and make it better, not only for our students, but for ourselves. We have an impressive panel of guests today to answer your questions. So let me introduce them. Benedict Pasquale, CEO of AMV. Well-known Tim Topham for Top Music and a Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. And Anastasia Butner-Moore, Vice President of WA Music Teachers Association, a music business owner and piano teacher. Hello. Let's begin with Bernard Di Pasquale, CEO of Amy B. Welcome, Bernard. Hi, Gillian. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Bernard, many of us feel like we're floundering in this environment to plan our students' learning path for the year. How is the Amy B planning to support the teaching community over the next few months? Um, look, we've moved fairly quickly to do a number of things. So on our website, we have a number of resources for how to start teaching online, which has been the first question where most teachers have started from, how do I do this? Um, we have our own webinar series going, which have initial webinars have all been about how to set up online and they're continuing next week. Um, with a range of different guests and different positions from piano to instruments and so on. So they're quite an important resource. And another thing that we've done is uh, we've made our theory courses, grade one to three theory of music, um, free for students who are stuck at home, don't have much to do. Maybe some adults have always wanted to learn theory, never got around to it. Um, so they're a free resource now, and that's proved to be something incredibly popular actually. Yes, I think uh, you were saying there's thousands of people who've registered over the last uh, few Yeah, we're, we're over 14,000 now today, so wow. yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, thank you. And we've got links to these resources that we'll put in our show notes. So, um, so if you don't know how to get there, just look in our show notes and there'll be links there. Tim Topham, Top Music, uh, uh, well-known Tim Topham <laughs> of Top Music and Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You've been posting resources for teachers since this started, and you've generously provided us uh, links to a range of resources, which we will put in the show notes. Tim, from the flurry of activity to bolt something together to go online, uh, the dialogue now seems to be shifting a little bit to how can we improve our setup? Um, we've received a number of questions of this nature, and I'd like to address the first question to you. Sure. It comes from uh, Connor Taylor and he asks, what's the best setup for a studio in terms of getting a microphone, boom stand, etc., improving the quality of sound? Connor needs to be able to record accompaniment tracks for BCE students as well as teach piano online. So, well, thank you very much for having me and uh, thanks for putting this together. Uh, what I, I think you're absolutely right. We've got to this point now where uh, most people have done a couple of weeks of lessons and have got all that started. And now it's like, okay, well, how can I actually improve this? And one of the first things people want to do is be able to show a top down view if they're not already doing that. Um, so I actually think what I might do is share some pictures of my setup, uh, Gillian, if that's okay. Um, and then I'll talk through some of those um, different bits of kit that teachers may want to invest in as they are able to. So I'll pop over to my photos now. Let me know if you can see that okay. Yep. Um, so this is uh, what I use to hold an overhead microphone now, uh, sorry, overhead camera. And this is a phone holder. Uh, there's a variety of ways that you can connect different cameras into Zoom. Uh, so this is held on a uh, boom stand, which you can see here. So this is a microphone boom stand. These are pretty cheap on Amazon or from a music store. Um, and at the end, this just holds a camera uh, if you want to use a phone. Or if you want to just use a webcam, you could just just gaffer tape, like just masking tape a camera to that stand 
uh, to hold it over the, the piano. That's totally fine as well. Um, as for webcams, now, unfortunately, I think a lot of the Logitech webcams have sold out recently because of the popularity of everyone going online. Uh, so this is what I use. It's a C920, I think it's called. Um, but look, if you can just get a webcam, preferably in HD, that's a high definition webcam, then go with what you can get at the moment. You can always upgrade that. Um, later on. As for microphones, and Connor asked about microphones and recording things. So the microphone I'm using now is called a Rode Podcaster. Now this is not the recommended type of microphone. What you want to aim for, I'll just go to um, a couple of options for you, Connor and others out there, is a condenser type of microphone. So these are designed to capture music uh, and audio really clearly. It's also designed for singers. So you'll see singers in, in movies and things, they'll have their headphones on and they'll be in front of a microphone with a pop shield. This is the kind of microphone there is. So this is a Blue Yeti. Uh, it's proving to be really popular. The other one uh, that is very popular is this one here. It's called a Snowball. Uh, again, quite good for uh, just general musical use for recording audio. Um, and the one that I actually started my podcast with was is this one, the Audio-Technica AT2020. That's actually nothing to do with the year. That is just their model number. Uh, and again, these are all great microphones for picking up music in general. So if you're a violin teacher, a flute teacher, uh, these are the kinds of mics you can use. I also skipped past uh, headsets. So I interviewed uh, Stephen Hughes, who does a lot of online teaching uh, recently for my podcast, and he uses a headset. And these kind of microphones, they're designed to pick up whatever's in front of your mouth most clearly. But I find that if you have loud pianos or really big grand pianos, sometimes it can overwhelm some microphones. And so these kinds of close lapel microphones, so this is a lapel microphone, uh, these can also pick up sound of the piano quite well and it's not too loud for the system. So I actually record a lot of my courses and videos using the one that's on screen, which is just a simple USB lapel mic. Uh, so I think that's, oh, the only other thing to share is just grab a USB hub. If you've got a computer that doesn't have many USB connections, you might need a few extras. So what's called a USB hub will just convert one USB port to a few more and you'll be able to plug in uh, a number of different devices. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps answer Connor's question. Um, and as I say, these are all next level things and I've recorded a video just for you guys and just released today, which you've got a link for, which actually shows three ways of connecting an overhead camera, either with a phone or plugged in with a webcam. Mm -hmm. And um, don't underestimate, of course, the, um, the cre creativity that you can come up with some of these things. Uh, right. one, of, <laughs> uh, one of uh, our business partners in England actually um, got a particularly a pro proper one, he didn't use a boom mic, it's actually an attachment that goes onto a microphone stand and has like two pieces of a, an arm that comes across somewhat like a lamp. And I've mm -hmm. got a lamp, I thought, oh, I've got a lamp like that. And so that lamp is being refashioned. Right, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, absolutely. Use a lamp, use, uh, I've, I've heard people, actually, Annie, you were talking about using, uh, students using ironing boards because it's, multi, you know, changing the height <laughs> to for get their the yeah, yeah. So uh, just just get inventive. I've seen people hanging iPads in their holders off coat stands and things like that to get the right angle for a student. We've mm -hmm. got to be inventive. Yes. Can I do. also comment whilst we're talking about being inventive with these things? Um, if uh, a lot of you are already jumping online and are trying to buy yourself a, a better quality camera or something and finding that you know they're all completely sold out, just reach out on some of your local Facebook groups, as I did for one of my mobile teachers, and you know you you might be able to just find someone will come in. And, and they'll be able to just say, look, I, I'm really stuck for a camera. Just, can it, I borrow one or buy one off someone in the local community? So, You did that actually, didn't you? And I did that. I was very lucky. I said I'd bake the guy a cake when it was safe to do so. <laughs> Gillian, I can see Connor's followed up with a question about positioning the microphone. Shall I answer that quickly? Yeah, that'll be great. Um, so if, um, if you've ever seen recording studios, pianos are in actually, uh, they're actually very difficult instruments to record really well. I think probably only beaten by the pipe organ. Uh, but for, for microphone placement of pianos, you've really just got to experiment and it will depend on your room and it'll depend on the type and size of piano as well. Uh, oftentimes, you, you certainly, if it's a grand piano, you don't want to sit it on the piano. Somewhere nearby is great just to capture a bit of the room sound as well. But Connor, just uh, test it in a few different places and see what sounds the best. Mm -hmm. And it does somewhat depend on whether you're looking at using a digital piano or a grand piano, for example, 
uh, overload can be a real problem, can't it? Mm. Zoom doesn't cope well with um, very loud um, recordings. The other day right. I was doing a recording for um, um, well, a course we've got coming up. And to me, the, uh, the sound of my USB speaker was a bit soft and I turned it up. And as soon as I did that on the recording, I lost it. It mm. just went. It, that it sound good to me, but actually, on the I would be better off with a slightly lesser sound volume than what, uh, than, yeah, than what because the microphone was picking it up. Also, um, while we're on this point, uh, Megan Scott asked, um, "How do I improve, improve the quality of sound through Zoom for piano teaching?" The, your comments about using their um, a better microphone does that does that really go towards the Zoom? Does that transfer onto that, or is yeah, yeah it, it does. But if, unfortunately, most of our students only have iPads or tablets, so it's, you can't really plug a microphone into those. So you're a little bit stuck. What you can do, Megan, is just make sure at your end, as long as you're on a laptop or a desktop using Zoom, that you've turned off the audio suppression feature, which is uh, down the bottom. Once you've started your room, go down to the uh, microphone settings, go to that little up arrow, and there's uh, some audio settings in there. One of them is a checkbox which stops the sound suppression, which is automatic in Zoom unless you turn it off. I, I do have a video, which I think I've shared the link to. If I haven't, we'll certainly add it to the show notes. It's like a one minute trick will really help with your sound. If you're on iPad though, unfortunately, if you're teaching with an iPad, the, some of these settings aren't available. So if you can at all use a laptop or a desktop, you're gonna have more success as a teacher. I think that this, um, what we've just, our discussion also goes towards um, solving Vivian Spencer's question as well. So thank you, Vivian, for writing in. Um, Kaimataro also asks, is one platform better than, and this is an, a, 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 um, a question I've seen to all lots of um, uh, forums as well, is one platform better than others for teaching purposes like Teams, um, Zoom, Skype, Google Hangouts? Uh, Going to go with this one, Annie? Yep, Tim, oh. uh, Annie, would you like to answer this? Sure, look. Um, I have primarily used Skype over the last five or six years while I've been teaching online, but that's because I hadn't quite discovered how amazing Zoom was. I converted to Zoom probably about three weeks ago when all of this stuff started escalating. And I have to say it's worked pretty well for about 95% of my students. Although there have been the odd uh, student here or there that for some reason, it's just their quality is, is not great on their, their side. And I've just switched over to Skype or FaceTime uh, because they just had issues setting up and I just want to make sure the lesson's still being delivered at the time it needs to be done and don't want to waste time. And these are just kind of accessible things. So you may need to be flexible, but in my personal opinion, Zoom's definitely been the best out of the things that I've tried. And I've tried a few things. Mm. Tim, would I, you like to add to that? Yeah, I agree. Uh, Zoom for me is, is the best one. And I can see there's still questions coming up. You know, I've tried the audio settings. What else? One of the biggest impacts on any platform for audio quality is the internet speed of you and mm. your student. So one of the biggest issues I'm having is that the students I'm teaching, their brothers and sisters are all playing video games. Their parents are streaming Netflix. If all that's happening while you're trying to run a lesson, forget it your sound's gonna be all over the place. So what you must do is give your students and their parents some tips about everyone get off the internet, close all your other tabs and browsers. And if you can do the same thing, that's great. If you can plug yourself in hardwired into the router at your place, that's going to help as well. And that will stop the audio going and all that weird stuff that it does, which is very annoying. Yes, and also this sometimes internet speed depends on what, what's better, whether you're going on the mobile network or um, or not, because this True. depends on your area. It's all just very specific. So yeah. what so works as, in your place doesn't work so good in your student's place. So it's about finding that ideal. Um, and fiber. yeah, as Annie says, just be flexible. Try try going on Wi-Fi, uh, wi try going on cellular network instead. The other thing, if, if it is just a disaster, what you can do is connect with a video link through Zoom, like we're doing here, and then get their parents to phone you on your phone and connect the audio that way. And you can listen to the audio through the phone while you're doing a video call on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Another little trick. Terrific. Bernard, do you have anything to add on that one? Um, we've found Zoom to be the best platform for what we're doing, but it um, uh, sounds like we all have shares in Zoom, but I don't think we do. <laughs> so they just happen to be well placed. I wish. <laughs> um, but it is an issue that it's a platform set up for business meetings, not for music. And uh, we were trying to check the uh, pitch of an A in a staff meeting the other day because there, there is a myth going, well, I think it's a myth going around that um, 
that the pitches dropped by a quarter tone, but each time someone tried to play the violin, it suppressed the sound. And so it's just, uh, it's not designed for music and you do have to play around with it a lot to get it to work for how you want it. I think that's a, that's a very good response. Okay, well, our next question, let's move on to our next question. We've got a lot of questions coming in on, on, our, on our sidebar. We'll try to get to those ones as well, but we've also got people who actually uh, asked their question in advance, so we're really prepared to go with those. Our next question is a video question, and it comes from Vanessa Munns of Western Australia. So we've got um, a video to play for you. Um, my name's Vanessa. I've been teaching online now for two whole weeks. It's been an interesting um, time where I've actually had to change how I explain things in comparison to doing when I do a face-to-face -face lesson. Um, I primarily have beginners through to early intermediates um, for all my instruments that I teach. And um, my question is, or one of my questions is, is that I do a lot of duets with them um, to help solidify the um, rhythm concepts I'm trying to, t to get solidified. How do I do this over doing the virtual lessons? Because um, I've just gone, no. Um, and then also using off bench activities, improv composition, I actually haven't even started on those um, yet uh, in the transition. I'm primarily at the moment going, we're doing scales, doing method book and your piece. And that's about it, especially with all the um, uh, explaining and, and demonstrating that I'm doing differently and stuff like that. So yeah, how am I going to start incorporating those at, um, online because it's something in the back of my mind. And um, at the moment, all I'm doing is using my iPhone with Messenger FaceTime. Do I really need anything else tech-wise to help me out? See, piano. Um, looking forward to your um, responses. Catch up. Bye. Well, we had three questions there, really. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about duets online and teaching improvisation and composition online and, and about the tech, what tech's best. So let's kick off with you, Tim, because you're a real advocate for uh, multidimensional teaching and not just to be doing straight um, you know, pieces and scales and uh, that kind of thing. And, you know, I think Vanessa's done the right thing and just let's scale it down. Let's just do something really simple to get kick this off. And then we can start to move into some of the creativity things. But what, what advice do you have? Mm. Well, firstly, congratulations to Vanessa and all the teachers out there for just jumping in. I, we know this is a really uh, challenging time and you've done such a great job. Give yourselves a pat on the back and a glass of wine at the end of the week because I know how hard you've all been working. It's, it's, and it's really exhausting. That's what I'm hearing from a lot of teachers. Uh, I don't teach 40 students uh, at the moment. I can only imagine how tiring that is. So congratulations, firstly. Uh, unfortunately, there's no way to play duets, as Vanessa, you've no doubt found out, and others, uh, until uh, some technology comes out which somehow beats the laws of physics. I'm not sure how this is going to work. There is only one way that you can play duets at the moment, and that's using a feature called Internet MIDI. It's a bit of software, uh, and you'd need to wire in your keyboard, uh, your digital piano to your computer and the student would need to do the same thing and you can play in real time together. But that is a very much a next level thing. So don't worry about that at the moment. Quick answer to do I need anything other than FaceTime? I would, uh, I think you're going, while it's been great for a couple of weeks, I think you're going to find that if you use FaceTime and Messenger and those video platforms, you will start to lack in your ability to do things like overhead camera views add different microphones easily, things like that. Uh, you, well, I mean, you can add new microphones on FaceTime, I guess, if you've got a laptop, but I think Zoom does give you more features, more ability to add different camera views and things like that in the future. But if it's working for you now, then I say, just keep on going with it until you're ready to take a step up to another, another level. Mm -hmm. Finally, with regards to creativity, yeah, you, you can absolutely do creative things. Uh, you just, as you said, need to sometimes rethink how you go about saying things. Um, I, I've been loving doing call and response type activities. That works really well. You can't clap in time with your students, but you could clap a rhythm. You could play, say, okay, I'm over a uh, you know, G major five finger position and one, two, three, four, I'm going to play these notes. Can you hear what I played and try and play that back? Or could you play a response to me? So things like that still work. And for those of you who use Piano for Leisure 4, 
um, a lot of those creative ideas about taking some elements of a piece and being able to improvise with them still 100% works. So you could say to the student, okay, well, this piece you're playing has this cool boogie left hand. Uh, let's try, let's practice a scale over the top of that and let's do some improvising. So that still works. You just can't play in time with your students uh, at the same time. So the only real solution there is to record, pre-record backings and then have them send them to the student so they can press play at their end and they can play along with it at their end. That's unfortunately one of the limitations we've got at the moment, Vanessa. Mm -hmm. Annie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I was gonna say another really cool feature about um, Zoom particularly is the screen share function. And particularly now that Bernard's told us that these uh, Amy B online theory things are coming out for free and we're getting a lot more students on board with this, which is very exciting. Uh, but there's also the ability if you say are an iPad user, even if not, if you just wanna have some manuscript or some resources, worksheets, scores, whatever up on your screen, you can actually draw and annotate and do these things and all of those features are built in on Zoom. So it gives you that opportunity if you want to tackle a bit more of the theory side of things as well, um, which is, it's just handy to have that sort of visual thing. And I believe the students can also share their screens too. So you can see exactly what they're working on in real time and comment on that as, as they're working through it. So. And we're going to do, next week's show, we've got a lot of um, great um, presenters coming on. We're going to be talking about a lot more of those um, sort of teaching alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, that, that's really great. That annotate uh, function in uh, Zoom is fabulous for that point of view as well. Um, our next question comes from um, Wendy McDonald and she's looking for ideas on assessing students who have worked hard to prepare for a piano exam, exam so they're kind of almost ready for it. They were probably coming in their first sitting and are now disappointed because Amy B have had to cancel their first metropolitan exams. Amy, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I believe, um, I think the uh, exams are looking at it going online, aren't they, Bernard? Yes, so I'm going to talk to about that. I just sort of yes. uh, ask, this is for students now who are like, supposed to be going to be doing an exam in like a week or so time. Perfect. Well, it might be actually a really good time to band together maybe with another uh, teacher in your community and maybe see if they're happy to do kind of some mock exams online and perhaps test the stuff that they've been working on and seeing what an outsider perspective is. And, you know, when, when it does come to the point where online exams are available, then, you know, they've, they've had a couple of goes at it and, you know, having that sort of unfamiliar setting, but it'll just become familiar because they, they, they get to practice that. Yes. And let's go to uh, let's go to Bernard now. And let, um, could you tell us what's happening coming up with uh, with Amy B and what arrangements have been made for going forward? Sure. So Amy B is looking at making um, video exams available for our repertoire exams, and that's at different uh, uh, reach different levels in different states. So some states are already offering that. It's coming in other states. You really need to go to your state website just to get the most current information. But everybody's working towards that where a student can record their exam program, send it in via a, you know, a private or unique link and then have their uh, performance assessed by an Amy B examiner. Um, so that's uh, definitely coming or available in some states already. So please look at your state office for that. And we'd like everybody to be able to try and have their exam this year if they can. Um, obviously, at the moment, all states are allowing exams to be transferred to later um, without any fees being charged or anything, and people can opt for a video exam or for a in situ exam when that becomes available later in the year, assuming it does. So, mm -hmm. but be patient with the state officers because it's a huge business change for us to suddenly go from delivering in person exams to um online or video exams and everybody's working really hard just to get that available and happening yes and just a clarity on um connor taylor asked would this mean that comprehensive exams are not possible uh we're doing some trialing of that in a couple of small examination ses sessions in two states just looking at different platforms a uh, comprehensive is obviously more difficult because there's interaction with the examiner so somebody has to ask general knowledge questions oral tests we're just figuring out ways that that can be done uh, both efficiently but securely and um, in a way that still maintains the quality of the exam. So I, I can't say if that will be generally available or not, but we are working, we're doing a number of trials just to see what might be possible and what can work. Yes. 
and it, even if it's, you know, this is a unique time and, and unprecedented, as everyone says, mm. unique circumstances. So um, that we can have our, our students can sit an exam, even if it is a more cut down syllabus in terms of being repertoire only, at least they have an assessment and can move on to the next stage. Yes. And uh, the other thing that Amy B's just done recently is included for leisure syllabuses in the repertoire exam. So if you're doing piano for leisure, for example, you can now uh, do that as a repertoire exam, do one extra piece and you don't need to do the technical work or the um, uh, section three oral test sight reading. So we're trying to make it as available for any, any everyone who wants to do an exam can do an exam as best as we can, as you say, in these unprecedented times. <laughs> exactly. We've also had another question from Margaret from Cobran near Wangaratta, and she asks, will there be any online practical exams available for country students in August and November? Certainly video exams will be available to everyone, so uh, no problem there. Online exams, as in live synchronous exams, are complicated because of the uh, technology and the logistics of it, and so, the way that would work best is, is if everybody could come into a center that's already set up with a good microphone and a good instrument and all that stuff. And that's the very thing we can't do. If we could do that, we could just run live exams. So um, people doing it from home, it would become very complicated to have 10 students lined up uh, to do an exam live with an examiner. The first student has a lot of technical problems and suddenly the whole session's running 20 minutes later. But how do you tell all the other students? And it's just logistics are quite com more complex than you would think. Mm, yes, exactly. Mm. And I think also this is a this has a changing. It, look, look at how quickly this has changed. And even if there's a slight relaxation in, in future months, that actually might make possible something now, which is impossible. Um, so it's just, we've just got to be flexible. Is that, is that what you're thinking? And we're obviously optimistic that later this year we will be able to go back to face-to-face -to -face exams, you know, and um, so we would expect that to be possible. But of course, we no one can guarantee that at the moment. So we just have to wait and see. Yes, exactly. Um, our, this question is from Greg Schultz. Um, and I'd like to throw this to Anna. As instrumental teachers, can we or should we expect to be able to charge our normal fee when conducting individual lessons through an online platform such as Zoom? Absolutely. I, I feel very strongly about this one. So I think the, the quality of our teaching and, and generally the style of our teaching is not going to change a great deal. It's only the format. And I know a lot of uh, teachers are quite concerned at the moment about uh, you know, potentially parents losing jobs and, you know, the, the income thing happening like that. But at the same time, there's, there's a lot of people who aren't at this stage. And, you know, uh, I think that's something that we can't kind of undervalue ourselves because that undervalues the rest of our industry. And it's really important to keep that consistent and the same. Yes, yes, very much. And Tim, what would you, um, would you like to add anything here about this? Yeah, uh, just fully support what Annie uh, said. And I can see that Jody asked a question about offering scholarships and bursaries to uh, students with financial hardship. Of course, that's, that would be your prerogative to do. I would strongly encourage teachers to do that if they are able, because I know that if uh, parents and students do quit now, it's much harder to get them back in two months time than it is if you're still offering something at either a discounted or even I've heard some teachers offering for those really great students who are truly f f um, finding things difficult financially, free lessons, uh, to at least keep it going so that you can keep that connection with them and keep them progressing. But that's that's a, st a studio choice, a parent um, teacher choice. But don't ro don't lower your rates, guys. Definitely don't. Mm -hmm. Bernard, would you have anything to add? Uh, we agree. Um, what I think. I find fantastic about this is in this crisis, what we get is a lot of teachers coming to us saying, the, their first question is, how can I keep teaching? And they're so passionate, committed, they just want to do their job. It's a really important relationship for the student with their teacher. And the fact that it's being delivered online doesn't devalue it. It really, it's harder work for the teacher. So, you know, it'd be fairer to put your fees up, not down, not that I'm recommending <laughs> that. But, no, I definitely wouldn't suggest anyone reduces their fees just because it's online. Yes. 
Yeah, and we... one last thought, sorry, on that one, Gillian, too, is, you know, if you think about it, we're probably one of the only, um, <clears throat> pardon me, um, the co-curricular sort of activities that has not been cancelled. So people probably have spare budget if they're not paying for sports and, and dance and all the other after school stuff that they would normally be doing. So, mm. Yes, exactly. And mm. I've been thinking about why this question has come up because it's come up in our uh, Forte um, School of Music community as well, should we be charging less? Um, and I think it's because very often online, there's many people who do one-to-many courses they do a course they video it and then they offer it for a seemingly very cheap price um, but that's because they've done the work once and are then reselling that work several several times um, but this is your time you are um, you know you are there for your student one-on-one -on -one. it's the same whether you're there in person or whether you're there at the end of the line you are um, spending that time so your time is still worth the same amount if whether you're online or whether you're in person I would have would have thought so perhaps that's where it comes from um okay so lawyer with uh so paul's just written a note, note to me saying a lawyer with legals on zoom we have had that video as a separate response we should show this okay so we actually have a um paul will not wants to throw to a clip so let's do that now i think he does <laughs> My name is Jackie Broman and I'm a solicitor from TBA Law. So a lot of you are probably going to online live video teaching and there's been a question about whether that is breaking child protection laws in Australia. So no, generally not. So if you're working with children, you're going to have a working with children check anyway. What can break child protection laws is if you are recording a child um, without consent. So live video without recording shouldn't be a problem. Um, but always, always, always anyway with the parents, just get a simple consent form signed from them. So even if it's as simple as at the top consent and then it says I, their names hereby consent to you teaching my child or children and their names um, via video um, and whether you're going to be recording it or not and you can pop that in to the consent and have them signed. So if you have that on file, you've got your working with children check, you shouldn't have an issue there whatsoever. The other issue that might arise with child protection is just if your video is not secure. So um, it's rare but obviously people can hack your phones and your computers and have access to your video and then be recording remotely. So that's more of an IT issue. It's not something that you can control or necessarily that you would be liable for. Um, but obviously you don't want to be putting any students at risk of being, you know, having their videos used for who knows what. So just make sure that you've got, you know, proper firewall protections on your internet connection um, and that you regularly check your computer for um, viruses. So um, I don't think that you've got any Thing to be concerned about there. In fact, more and more people are going to be working online and there are already so many communities where um, tutoring and lessons are done online anyway. Well, that's um, an advice that we had uh, earlier this week um, to help us just with the legalities around it so to make sure that we're all covered and that everything that you have things in place. That's Are really we, useful, uh, Gillian, because I've, mm -hmm. I've had the same question uh, from people too. So it's really good to just get that real clarity, I think. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. We've also um, had a question about where we've talked about some resources and links that are going to be available and where are they going to be? Um, if you are registered, if you've registered for this webinar, you will be sent them in an email. Um, and if you haven't, we will also have them on um, a page in Piano Teaching Success um, for you to download. So you can have a look there. Um, our next question comes from Pamela Gubaris and it's her question says, in amid the COVID-19 global crisis, if both teacher and student are well, is it possible to conduct private instrumental teaching, for piano for her, as long as all hygiene measures are taken? Now, Paul has spoken to Dr. Chi Ong, who is an emergency doctor at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and he has this to say. 
I hope. <laughs>。Pleased to introduce Dr. Chi Ong from the Emergency Department of the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Now, Dr. Ong, there's been so many changes in COVID-19. I, I know you'd like to tell us that about the information that you might give us today. Sure. Thanks, Paul. So um, before before we answer any questions, I just like to sort of uh, put out a, a disclaimer that uh, the situation around uh, COVID-19 is changing so rapidly that my views today may not reflect my news, uh, my views tomorrow, and uh, they certainly do not necessarily reflect the views of all healthcare professionals uh, in my field at the moment. Uh, but I, uh, the I guess my opinions today and my advice to you uh, are, are based on what we currently know uh, in terms of the best evidence that we have. Pamela has asked. Amid the COVID-19 global crisis, if both teacher and student are well, is it possible to conduct private instrumental, i.e., piano teaching, as long as all hygiene measures are taken? So the answer to this may not be, I guess, as straightforward as we may think. Uh, I guess in in a short answer, yes, of course it's possible, but with every social contact that we have uh, in these times, there is a risk involved. And for every step or measure that you take to reduce that, uh, to in terms of promoting hygiene methods, uh, it reduces that risk. And the best method, I guess, to completely uh, avoid that risk would be uh, with what we're doing now, so with video conferencing. Um, when we talk about COVID-19, what we do know in this day and age is that COVID-19 can be transmitted and can be uh, carried by asymptomatic people. So uh, there are cases of asymptomatic uh, carriers and there are uh, cases of asymptomatic transmission. Uh, although that only forms a small portion of COVID-19 cases, we do know that uh, about one in four cases of COVID-19 is transmitted through asymptomatic manners. Um, so with that being said, um, although you and your student may seem well, it does not necessarily mean that one of you doesn't have uh, the virus itself. In terms of measures to, to prevent transmission, uh, we can, you know, look into things like, you know, hand hygiene before touching the keyboard, uh, after a, a lesson, things like that, uh, avoiding physical contact, wiping down keyboards and instruments with uh, disinfectant wipes uh, and, you know, staying appropriate social distancing with 1.5 meters uh, away from each other and things like that. So all those methods would effectively reduce your risk of transmission, uh, but it does not guarantee, uh, I guess, uh, complete safety uh, or lack of transmission uh, because of these cases of asymptomatic transmissions. Um, we actually have had a legal opinion come in this week as well, um, and we might actually throw to that, and then I'm going to ask for some comments from our, from our panel. <laughs> I hope we are getting that ready. Well, in the meantime, how about we actually have some comments about, um, about this? Tim, would you like to go first? Yeah, look, I, I think... On all the best advice, I'm in Melbourne. Uh, Victoria has been very clear that you are only to go out under four circumstances, and one of them is not piano teaching or piano lessons. Um, we're not an essential service, so I'm afraid uh, I would be saying for your own protection and for that of your students and their families and their grandparents and all our elderly relatives, uh, we need to stick to the online. And it's going to be like that for potentially a month or more. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think the advice... Is, is right, you could do it, but I don't think we should be doing it. Okay, and Bernard, what, what about you? Yeah, uh, I, I agree with that. Um, it may be that a gathering of two is okay, so theoretically a teacher and student could have a lesson, but we think it's very much not in the spirit of what the government is trying to achieve. And 
uh, as Tim says, only a, you should only go out for essential purposes or if you're an essential worker. And much as we love all our music teachers, mm -hmm. I don't think we qualify as essential workers in that sense. And it can be done in other ways. And that's the key thing, people. That's what we're talking about today, obviously. So, you know, I know that's hard for some teachers, but um, nonetheless, they can get there. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've just had a, a comment in from Carol uh, Veldhoven, who said the current rules will be in place until July. This is, was in the, music, uh, in the news this morning. Um, mm -hmm. Annie? Yeah, likewise, I think it's, we're all in this together and we need to just be really um, mindful that, you know, the, the, the more that we can follow the advice of the government and, and don't try to, you know, stretch the rules, so to speak, the, the quicker hopefully this whole thing will be over, you know. Yeah, yeah, mm. I think that's true. Yeah. And um, the, look, the legal advice we had is that legally, yes, you probably could. But I think uh, very importantly, Dr um, Chi Ong, uh, really highlighted the fact that there is, well, 80% of it or whatever, a large proportion of, the, of our um, COVID transmission is through people coming, returning from overseas. There is a small percentage and a growing percentage um, that is just being com uh, community transmission. And this is the one that they're really concerned about. Mm -hmm. And so this social distancing and teaching from home and, and sure you can go out for education purposes and for business purposes, but we do have an option you know, mm -hmm. where you can't do it. And we do have an option. So um, it's not a week or two weeks. It is for a few months. So it's best to probably get on board. I think that's, would the, would the panel agree on that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. It is. Completely. Terrific. Um, we've also had another question come in about um, copyright. And we'll address that next week because I think it's a really um, tricky little situation, that one. So. Uh, you can buy music online. You don't have to go out. So if you don't have a second copy of it, you know, it's very important. I think everyone's found that they really need their own copies of the music. And if you don't have your own copies of the music, you maybe need to do that. Um, so we'll address that one next week. But um, our last question today comes from Ku Jarvis, who, like many of us, is on her second week of teaching online. And while she's happy that it went fairly well last week, who writes it, I'm concerned that maybe some of my students won't continue next term if parents can't afford to, which would leave me in a difficult financial situation as I only have a small number of students. My other income is derived from live performance, which of course has completely ceased. Can you provide any information on how to get government assistance? Bernard, I know that you've been looking into this for your own staff. Could you mm. talk about this point? So, the, yeah, happy to. The government announced this week the um, Job Keeper program, and that's a really key program for keeping staff employed, but it also applies to sole traders. And so if you're a piano teacher and perhaps part piano teacher, part performer, if your income has dropped by more than 30%, then you will qualify personally or for your staff if you're employing other people for a subsidy of a wage of $1,500 a fortnight. And so um, I think for a lot of teachers, if your business has dropped off, it may well be that that's something that you can apply for and will really just get you through this period. Um, the government's guaranteed that for six months and it's effective from the 1st of March. But you just need to get online. There's a lot of fact sheets. If you Google Job Keeper Program ATO, there's a lot of fact sheets. You need to register with the ATO, and then they will um, send you through information as it comes to hand. So, mm -hmm. I think it's a good program that will help a lot of people. Yes, uh, Tim, do you have anything to say on this point? Uh, no, but I did see that there was another question about that in the, the Q&A, so uh, hopefully that's been answered for that uh, teacher, but Bernard's uh, summed it up well. I haven't looked into it too deeply yet, uh, so I think we just have to go and do some research, but that was my understanding too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Annie? Uh, not, not a lot else to add to that one, no. Mm. I think, um, you know, I'm definitely in that boat. I've lost a lot of performance work, but, you know, I feel like um, having the option of teaching online now has actually given... Um, I've actually got a lot more new students in the last few weeks, so um, I'm supplementing with teaching, uh, extra teaching income at this stage, but, you know, something else to look into. Yes. I think for us, uh, generally, while some students have gone, just can't make the step into the, I know we're now four day schools, we've had not very many, actually, pleasingly, but there's just been some students, parents have gone, you know, I 
can't do it uh, for whatever reason, have decided not to step into the online uh, format. Um, but we are generally lucky that most of them have, and we won't really know yet, probably not until term two, not until April, even early May, um, what students we will have and what students are going to um, go on for the next term. I think also that um, it's really up to us to try and get the, our lessons as good as possible mm -hmm. and deliver our best um, uh, quality lesson at the moment, isn't it? Um, so that we can um, provide value for our clients and be that social, like they're gonna be a little bit isolated. There's no sport, not much dancing, I don't think. So <laughs> we might be that little friendly face at the end of the, uh, of the line for us. Um, yeah. Students. And as a, as a parent with kids at home, I'm quite enjoying the time when, when they have their music lessons online. So, I mean, that, that is a huge uh, bonus for, for parents who are trying to work and look after their kids. So, um, great to hear from Koo. Uh, sorry, you've lost your performance um, opportunities. That's, uh, that makes things really difficult. Um, but yeah, try and make next term just be a, an expectation this is how we're doing things now and it's how we're going to be doing things for a while uh i'm sure you weren't doing this but just try to avoid that sort of would you like to continue thing it's just it's not that it's we're just going to keep on going and this is the new normal and i've been hearing from a lot of teachers actually that parents a lot of parents are really on board they're really enjoying the experience of seeing their kids in, ingrained in this new way of learning uh, and a lot of the kids are enjoying it too so just let's keep it as positive as we can. Um, there shouldn't be, I know some teachers are experiencing a drop off and that may happen, but uh, let's just try and make this the expectation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Actually going back to, I'd just like to throw back to that copyright um, question, which I did um, uh, highlight just before and we're saying we'll do more on that. And we'll also have more on this, um, what's available from government subsidies. I mean, this is just so new. It's only came out a few days ago. And um, I think that government is still kind of getting their heads around how they're going to deliver it. Um, so we will get some more, we'll get a, an accountant if we can, or some professional advice on that too in um, forthcoming shows. Um, but Carol Veldhoven said that there, I'm pretty sure it's Carol, said that Amy B had a webinar last week with and had comprehensive copyright guidelines. Uh, Bernard, would you be able to expand on that? Um, I'm not exactly sure what she's referring to, but I can speak about that. At the moment, there's no difficulty in accessing music. And so you can order music online. All online retailers are still open. And if you need a copy of the music, then that's how we suggest you access it um, because there is no problem getting that. Uh, there are going to be a whole range of interesting copyright issues as we move to online teaching. And because generally any copy that you make of any music needs a license and even sharing music on a screen technically is you know breaching copyright um amy b is working with apra amcos uh with regard to amy b issues so one of the issues that we have is with um repertoire exams for instrumentalists um amy b provides recorded accompaniments up to grade three but above grade three uh the students need an accompaniment and there's not one available and in this environment they can't have one in their room and you can't do it online because of the lag that we talked about earlier so we're uh, making a special provision to allow uh, students to negotiate with an accompanist to record an accompaniment for them and we're just negotiating with APRA AMCOS to get a blanket license to allow that to be done in a legal way but people should just remember that even in this um, circumstance, there are still a whole range of rights around any copying that you do, audio, print, video syncing, and they just need to be managed appropriately. Mm. Um, back to the point you were talking about, if I own the music, my student owns the music, and then I put a copy up online and we're just talking about that so that I can project that online, and mm. is, because I own the music and the student owns the music, is that still in contravention of copyright law? Well, technically, to recreate a copy anywhere, you need a license. But of course, in that instance, when it's a private link between two people, I mean, and there's no, you're not selling it or anything, that it's not um, going to create an issue that for you. But technically, yeah, I think that would require a license in the strictest sense. Unless, of course, it's a public domain work, you know, but... Um, Hmm. Very. <laughs> this whole raises a whole heap of um, questions that we haven't ever had to 
addressed before. It's a very complicated area, and I'm sure you could get someone perfect from APRA and Kapasso, the Arts Law Council, to talk about this. Yes, yeah, yes, probably we can, but we will endeavour to get some more information on that, what, what we can and cannot do. Um, so, um, topics coming up next week, uh, we'll, you know, we've mentioned quite a lot of them today, um, and uh, we're certainly going to be focusing next week on different activities you can use in your lessons to engage your student. In different ways, we've got um, um, next week uh, lots of fabulous, as we've got in the coming weeks, uh, many, many wonderful uh, panellists to come on board. So um, I'd like to thank, uh, so Annie, you've also got a couple of resources you would like to share? Yeah, yeah, oh, I've, I've just got a little video. If, if there are still some people, and I know speaking to some of my local community over here and online, that um, a lot of people are still reluctant to get online. So I've got some uh, a little video, just if some, some of you are still wondering about how to get started. So, and that just shows a bit of my tech setup and kind of talks you through the guidelines and how to, how to kind of sell the online lesson thing to your, your families. Anyway, okay. So, yeah. That'll be useful because it's really about everyone getting on board, the, the students as well as yourself. Yes. Um, well, that's all we have time for today. Please thank Annie Anastasia, uh, Butner Moore, uh, Tim Topham and Bernard De Pasquale. And we've been inundated this morning with more questions. And next week we'll have another amazing panel to um, start answering them for you. Brenda Hunting from Brisbane is a very experienced online teacher and Taubman specialist. Carly McDonald, who many of you know as the co-editor of The Piano Teacher, and um, she's also the ambassador for Piano Adventures, favourite Piano Adventures in Australia, and the lovely Samantha Coates from Blitz, um, who is a very popular presenter and has a lot to add. Um, she, like you, has, I was just speaking to her last week, has been, you know, stepping into this for the first time. So she'll have some uh, great stories to tell too, I'm sure. Um, we really love audio and video questions, so please send your questions, uh, keep the questions rolling in. And if you, and for the brave, please do a video, a video a question because it was so lovely to have Vanessa today. Um, and whilst you haven't seen much of him today, Paul, I'd like to do a big thank you to Paul. Paul, who has come home from the UK, has been in isolation in his apartment. Lucky for him, he's been in an apartment, not in a hotel room. Um, <laughs> and he's been working all week. On putting this together and doing he's also been behind the scenes putting all the videos up and doing all the tech work to make this possible so on behalf of us today stay well keep up your physical distancing and be social online and keep washing those hands and we'll see you next week so goodbye bye everyone bye, bye.